Today we find ourselves in part two of our Dreamer series. We've titled the series Dreamer and we're studying the life and the journey of Joseph. Joseph's father's name is Jacob and Jacob's father's name is Isaac and Isaac's father's name is Abraham. So here we have the great grandson of Abraham. And so uh, we've, we've talked about uh, his family dynamics and what's happened in the past. So if you missed last week, go to Tahoe.Church, check that out. Uh, but today um, we're talking about something a little different. Now as vastly unique and different humanity can seem, we all have commonalities. Each and every person has common struggles, common hopes, common journeys. And I don't care what color your skin is. I don't care um, what's in or not in your bank account. It doesn't matter uh, where you were born or even where you currently live. All humans on this planet dream. We all dream. And I'm not talking about the dreams when you're sleeping, like REM, I'm talking about actually having hopes, aspirations, desires for something to come true. Your very DNA, it prompts you to do this. It pushes you to do this. It downright compels you to do this. You don't have a choice. We all dream dreams. The hope is the very fiber that keeps us from tearing apart. In fact, throughout the history of our world, in the darkest hours of human history, in the most deplorable, uh, depraved, debased events on our planet that have ever taken place, it's been hope. It's been hope that has continued to carry the soul of man. Scripture doesn't just say this is a good idea. The Bible actually tells us to. It, it commands us to hope, to hope for a brighter day, to hope for a new way, to hope for eternal life. Scripture calls this the hope of glory. See, hope, dreaming is the substance of faith. And in order to please God, you must have faith. So in order for us to please God, we must hope. We must dream. We must push. We must pursue. Faith pleases our creator, our savior, and our God. So now let me ask you, let's, 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 let's go to you. How often do you dream? And, and, and what do you dream about? Maybe what's, what's a current dream that, that you have right now? What is something that, that you want to attain, something that you hope comes true, something that you are pursuing and praying over? What is it, what is it for you? We all dream, but there may be differences among us. There are always things, there's always people, there's always tragedies, there's always events, there's always circumstances in our life that are not as they should be or could be. And they're always going to be there. If it's not this one, then it's gonna be another one. If it was last year, then it's gonna be a new one for this next year. They're always going to be there. I have had them and currently have them and so do you. But we can't let those setbacks, those trials, those pitfalls rule over us, ruin or end us. Tragedy comes to us all. Heartbreak comes to us all. Loss and failure are not foreign to the human condition. But what sets us apart, what sets a dreamer apart from others is not a lack of hurt or pain, but it's resiliency. It's the ability to get back up. It's the ability to pounce back. It's the ability to say, but tomorrow's a new day. But there's always next week, there's always next month, there's always one more step, there's always one more try. Always, always, always. So take the journey of dreams with Joseph, for example. In this series, we're studying Joseph. Joseph lived in the second century BC. He was a real person who lived in the pages of history. He walked this planet. And last week, we discussed his screwed up family. How many guys could relate to that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if you didn't raise your hand, then we know you're lying, okay? So last week, we discussed this fractured family tree and broken dynamics. And we looked at this long wave of mangled relationships, of backstabbing, of cheating. We started with Abraham and Sarah. God promised them they were going to have a kid, and she didn't believe God. So she decided to do it herself, and she got her maidservant over there, and she's like, why don't Abraham, you marry her too, because I want to have her baby. I want to raise her baby as my own. And they did, and then finally she had her own baby, and then she's like, well, I don't really want Hagar and Ishmael here anymore. Let's kick this 14-year-old to the desert to die, because now I got my own kid. So she created this really bizarre, fractured family because of her greed and not trusting God's word. And then this woman, Hagar, who did nothing wrong, and Ishmael found themselves cast out in the desert to die. 
and they didn't, God saved them, but they ended up, his lineage became enemies of the Israelites. So that was pretty screwed up. And then their son Isaac and Rebecca are married, and they have twins, which is great. But Rebecca convinces one of her twins that he's better than the other one to steal from her bro- his brother and to lie to his dad. His mom is giving him this advice. That's pretty messed up. And then we have Jacob has these 13 kids. And we say, well, by the time we get to Jacob and his family, it's no surprise that they're screwed up because his parents are screwed up. His grandparents are screwed up. And all the family is at war. You have Ishmael warring against Isaac. You have Jacob warring uh, against Esau. And then you have these 10 brothers, 11 brothers. And you're like, well, no wonder they're warring because that's the family. That's what this family does. This family fights. This family stabs each other in the back. And among all the calamity, a seed of bitterness has been planted in these 13 siblings. Father Jacob, the dad, knowingly or unknowingly, tends this seed and he's been watering it for years. He plays favorites, right? He spoils Joseph, his 11th son. Jacob makes it so Joseph doesn't have to do any of the family chores. He puts him in charge of his older brothers in the family business. He buys him special gifts that he doesn't give to the other children. He single-handedly unravels and dismantles his own family. This is what he does, and he doesn't even see it. And sadly, Unfortunately, today we're going to read of the repercussions, the outcome, the results of Father Jacob's actions. So I hope you brought your Bible this morning because there's no big screen behind me. We're going to be in the book of Genesis chapter 37. And I'll read it to you audibly, but if you need to see it visually, it'd be good for you to bring your Bible and notebook um, every Sunday. As you're turning there, let me tell you a story. Um, I got my license on my 16th birthday. I was at the DMV on January 14th. And uh, my buddy Dave also got his license on his birthday. And uh, our parents had a couple rules because we were young drivers. At that point, I was still driving the family minivan. I didn't have my own car yet. Yeah, I really helped my social life. Thanks. (laughs) Thanks for reminding me of that. Uh, And so uh, my parents had a rule where I couldn't drive further than 10 miles from like my house. So probably because I'd get lost, I didn't know where anything was. Um, And then my buddy Dave could not drive anyone in his car. That was the rule for them. Like it's unsafe, it'll be a distraction. But there was this one night that we wanted to go to a friend's house. Everybody was going and we wanted to drive together because it was a far distance. And so I said, uh, so Dave and I were like, how are we going to make this work? We want to go together. But my parents were like, you can't drive there because it's too far. And Dave couldn't drive anyone in his car. And so we were figuring out how we could drive to the party together. So I called Dave on the phone and, uh, and, and we start talking. I'm like, hey, man, I, I guess I'll just see you at the party. We can't drive together because of our parents' rules. And he goes, here's what we're going to do. You drive down the street from my house and park your car, turn your headlights off. I'll back up, say goodbye to my family, and then I'll pick you up in the corner and we can ride together and my parents will never know. And we did. And the plan worked flawlessly until, um, now wait for it here. Uh, so so uh, Dave comes back, drops me off at the car in the corner, look at the headlights off, I drive away, he pulls into the driveway, walks into the family room, and there are his parents waiting for him facing the front door. It's never good when like both parents are like sitting up waiting for you to get home. And he walks in and he's like, oh, hey guys, how's it going? And they're like, well, how's it going with you? It's going great. Did you have a good night, David? David, did you have a good night? Yeah, great night. Best night. Uh, David, um, did you drive anyone in the car tonight? Oh, no, I know. The, no, you guys know the rule. I didn't. No, I don't. I don't drive anybody in the car. Did you drive Terrence in the car tonight? No, I don't No, I did not. You, you sure? I'm positive. I did not drive Terrence or anyone in the car tonight. Then his dad gets up, walks over to the kitchen, and pushes a button on the answering machine. Now, for those of you who are too young to know what that is, it's like voicemail. It's like a cassette tape voicemail type thing. Just picture it that way. But what would happen is if the phone would ring like six times and you don't get to it in time, it would start recording, and then you pick up the phone and talk, and then it records your entire conversation. So there's on the answering machine, Hey, man, you park in the corner, turn off your headlights. My parents will never know. And they're like, would you like to change your story now, David? It's like, yes, yes, I would. Uh, Tonight, I picked up a friend. I didn't see David for a while. Um, David didn't drive for a while after that either. But it's interesting how when we adopt something that is wrong or that is sinful or a story, 
you're going to have to stick to it, and you're going to have to feed it, and you're going to have to water it. Is what addiction is. That's what sin is. It doesn't just go away. It pushes and pushes, and you need to cover up the old cover-up and cover up the old cover-up. And eventually you find yourself in this twisted web of deceit, of isolation, of loneliness, of loss, and you're like, how? How did I get here? Like, I, like this, this, spir- this spiraled really quickly out of control. And so the passage we're going to read this morning it ends with brothers wanting to literally murder their brother. Wanting, I mean, now we can all say that, like, oh, I could just kill you right now, but like literally want to murder their brother Joseph. And you think, how, how do you get there? Like, like how, did, how do we take a wrong turn back here to get to this point? So let's read this um, together and we'll see where we're at. Now, Joseph's brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel, which is also Jacob, his two names, right? Same guy, said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, Here I am. That's interesting. All of them are out working in the fields, and he's like at home. He's his dad's favorite. He's not even working. And the dad's like, I'm going to send you to go check on them. Why don't you go give me the report like you were their boss? It's bad. Okay, so he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. He came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields. And the man asked him, what are you seeking? Well, I'm seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where are they pasturing the flock? And the man said, they've gone away, for I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, one of the brothers, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let's not take his life, Reuben said to them. Shed no blood, throw him into this pit here, in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore. That's symbolic. That was the robe that the manager would wear, the boss would wear. You don't do any manual labor if you're wearing the robe with the long sleeves, and they rip it off of him. They've been thinking about it. They've been talking about it, and finally the time has come. It's, it's go time. They rip it, strip him of his robe, and they took him and assault him and throw him into the pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat. Nothing like assaulting your sibling to, to work up a good appetite, right? So he's stripped and assaulted and laying naked in this pit. And they're like, oh, let's have some snacks now, okay? That sounds good. That's how far they've gone. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin on their way, carrying it to Egypt. That's interesting. Ishmaelites. Remember? Ishmael was the 14-year-old who was thrown out in the desert by Abraham and Isaac. Now his offspring, I mean by, by Abraham and Sarah, now his offspring are the enemies of Israel, and they're the ones that are coming to get him. See how it all comes around? Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he's our brother, right? Come on, guys, he's our own flesh. Let's not murder him, let's just human traffic him. We have standards, right? And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes. He returned to his brothers and said, the boy is gone. And where can I turn? Then they took Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, dipped the robe in the blood. They had the long robe with sleeves taken to their father, and they said, this is, uh, this we have found. See now whether it's your son's robe or not. Uh, guys, you've been staring at that robe for the last, what, 14 years? You can't stand it. You just dipped it in blood. And they're like, I don't know. Like, we just found this bloody robe. Is this Joseph's? Like, like Dad, is this Joseph's? Is this that, that long robe that he'd always flaunt that you bought? I'm like, oh, we don't recognize it. We've never really seen it. But it's the source of all their anger, right? He recognized it and said, it's my son's robe. A wild animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins, one way to mourn, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and all his daughters sought to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, no, I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning thus. 
his father bewailed him. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. Okay, good. I'm glad you hung in there. But I wanted to read that whole passage right there. How do I begin? We just witnessed 10 brothers, half of them biological, half brothers. They consider murdering their brother Joseph. They're thinking about it. They see him, and just his image coming to them, they think murder. They stop there, they strip him, they assault him, and they throw him into a pit. Then they take a lunch break. It's a lot of work, right? A lot of work doing that. And then they sell him for a profit to slave traders from a foreign country. Joseph was trafficked by his own family. This is human trafficking, not by a pimp or an evil stranger, but actually his own brothers. See, reading this story makes my stomach turn. It's grotesque. It's disgusting. I can't believe that anyone would do this to another human, sell another human as a slave, let alone their own brothers. This should boggle our minds. It boggles mine. Doing something so repugnant at this to another human is unthinkable, but your own family should be unimaginable. Our church partners with an organization called Awaken, and we're actively supporting their quest to end the sexual exploitation of women in the state of Nevada. I've read document, that's right. I've read documentation of court cases where parents sell their own children to men for sex, their own kids. It's hard for me to imagine anything that Satan loves more and that God hates more than this. And I ask myself, how did we as a species get here? How, how are humans capable of doing something so evil to other humans? I don't, I, I can't even comprehend it. It seems psychotic. How does something so unspeakable even happen? And the answer is, it's us. We're, we're the answer of how, it's, of how it's possible. We're the cause of sin. Our gracious God, our creator, we're sitting in his creation. Our loving father has given us the gift of free will. We can choose right or wrong, good or evil. We get to choose it, light or dark. And we've made this gift that he's given us a curse. God allows us to do right or wrong. He allows us to love instead of hate, and yet we choose wrong. We cling to hate. We choose murder. To the point where God has to tell us, don't murder people. Don't hurt each other, because it is inside of us to want to, to cheat, to steal, to lie. It's in us. Now, is it the darkness of our own souls? Is it the greed of this world? Is it the evil of the devil? Why would a family sell their own brother into a life of slavery? And why would I, and why would you choose sin? Why? We always have the choice, but yet we, we still choose sin. I don't ask if we choose sin, I ask why we choose sin. We don't need to jog our memories, we don't need to attempt to conjure up scenarios where we've tripped, failed, faltered. The Bible clearly tells us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. So we're all sinners. All of us here, everybody here. There we have it. But what are we going to do about that? Yet we roll our eyes, we, we, we turn up our noses, we shake our head in disgust. And we say, how can these 10 brothers do this? But the truth is we're actually in the same boat as them. You may say, well, I would never personally, like I would never consider selling one of my family members to human traffickers. And, and maybe you're right. But you have willingly sinned against God at some point. And I hate to say it, and so have I. I've chosen sin. I've willingly disobeyed my creator, my heavenly father, and my savior. And we must ask ourselves, why do we do this? The God who made all of this and who made us and is offering us eternal grace and forgiveness and salvation, why would we ever do something against what he's instructed us to do? Why would we ever have a lapse in that judgment? Let's look at the story of Joseph, right? His father's given him a raw deal by loving him wrongly, favoring him too much, spoiling him, and Jacob, his dad, puts a big fat bullseye right on the back of his son, Joseph. And the only ingredient that is needed for this venomous concoction is the jealousy of his brothers, and voila, you have a recipe for the destruction of a life. So we begin with a terrible father, then we move to jealous siblings, then we find ourselves in a place of no foreseen consequences. 
It's important to state that they didn't take their sheep to Shechem. They kept going to Dothan. Why? Why was that surprising to Joseph? And it said that he was kind of lost. And where are they? Is because they went to a place where nobody knew them and they didn't know anybody else. There's freedom for sin and isolation and secrecy where no one knows you. There's no consequences. You're not going to get caught. You'll look at something online if you don't think anybody's going to know about it. You're going to think something in your brain. As long as you don't say it out loud, then it's not so bad. Well, if nobody's going to find out about the $50 here, or this, like whenever there is an opportunity for sin, usually it, spro- it grows and it sprouts out of isolation and anonymity. It's dangerous to be anonymous. Let me say that again. There's weakness and isolation. There's strength in numbers. Accountability is a good thing. Not having a password on your phone for your wife to look at is a good thing. Being transparent with your finances is a good thing. Being honest and upright with what you say and what you do is a good thing. There's freedom in it. There's strength in it. So they find themselves pasturing in a flock, and it says, they saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They've lived with him all these years. He's 17, and this is the first time murder is brought up. Now, they've hated him. It says that they couldn't say one peaceable word about him, and they fought with him, and they talked bad about him, but now they find themselves in a scenario, and they're like, okay, I've never murdered anybody, but man, we got, this, we, we got freedom right now. Nobody knows where we're at. We're out in the middle of nowhere. Now we have an opportunity for what's been in our heart and our mind to actually transpire into reality. They've been thinking it for a long time, but now they have a moment to actually do it. So what do they do? The act. Do you know where the majority of human trafficking, sex trafficking in our country takes place? At rest stops, along highways, exit ramps. Second place, motels and hotels on Super Bowl weekend. In the city of the Super Bowl. A different zip code in the company of strangers where you are anonymous with no legal ramifications. Here is where true sin can breed and live. What if laws and rules and legal guidelines were the only thing keeping us from doing bad things to one another, then our world would be in big trouble. Accountability is imperative for our survival, but a Holy Spirit-led conscience is the only answer for the curse of sin. It's not are you gonna get caught or not, it's the Holy Spirit quivering in your soul saying, I shouldn't look at this. I shouldn't think that, I shouldn't say that, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't. It's the Holy Spirit. It's not if you're going to get caught or not, because we see if humans think they can't get caught, these 10 brothers can't get caught, they're going to do it. They always do it. These brothers began with hurt feelings that led to jealousy, that led to hatred, that led to thoughts, that led to pondering actions, that led to actually ripping off their brother's clothes, throwing him in a pit, and selling him into a life of slavery. Sin is real, and it is dangerous. Have you ever asked yourself, how did I get here? How, how has it come to, to this? How do I find myself here? This isn't me. See, sin is, is, is sneaky. Satan is a deceiver and he's a liar and he won't tempt you with a huge, terrible screw up. He's too smart for that. What he does is he knows that you won't fall for this huge, erroneous blunder. No, he starts small, almost minuscule, almost like, like, like just a little thought, just a little bit. Like it's, like there's, there's no ramifications for this. And that's how he gets you. That's how he hooks it in. Sin begins with an emotion and possibly moves to a feeling or a thought. It's never usually an action. Not yet, at least. That would be much too, much too obvious. But once that thought takes root and you dwell on it for a while and you, and you consider it, then the action might actually become a possibility. And once an action is deemed possible, then it's just a matter of waiting for the right time, the right place, anonymity. And that's what happened with these brothers. This didn't just pop out of nowhere. All of a sudden, we hate him and want to murder him. No, no, this is years in the making. And they've allowed that gentle whisper of what if to continue to speak and speak and speak. And then the moment that they can actually act on it, they do. A whole new round of sin takes place once the action is completed. It doesn't stop. Sin never ends. There's a whole new thing you must do now. So 31, then they took Joseph's robe. 
Now what do we got to do? Well, we just stole this. Well, now let's just kill this innocent animal to kill, slaughter a goat, dip it in its blood. Then, then what do we have to do? Okay, let's think up a story. Um, let's, let's see. Uh, let's say a wild animal devoured him. Let's, let's go tell our dad that. Then they go and they tell their dad that. And then they're all their sons and daughters sought to comfort him through this. See, we got to understand sin is never satisfied. Satan never stops. It never ends. After the horrible thoughts, then comes the terrible act. Then follow literally years. For years, they lie just to cover it up. Years. They've already invested in the sin. They've already done the action. Now they got to keep it. Every birthday, they lie. Our poor dead brother, but they know. Every time their dad cries, they, they lie again. They lie again. They make up this lie. They tell it to their father. It says the whole family tries to deal with this terrible story. So not only is Joseph ruined, their father Jacob is destroyed, and all of the sons and daughters in the whole family are affected by what? The sin of these brothers. Now they will live out this lie and keep on living the lie every single day for the next 13 years until they come face to face with Joseph again. 13 years they continue to carry on the charade. See, Satan's not content with a simple misstep or a floundering mishap or moment. No, he doesn't just want your mistakes. He desires to devour your soul. These brothers are so deep in their mess, they don't see a way out. They've allowed themselves to slide down the slippery slope of sin and bondage. And here they are. Wow, that started with just jealousy. And then it became just talking bad about him. And then it became actually hating him, and they channeled it into possibilities. Do you, do you see this? That sin has affected multiple lives for future decades to come. And I guess not just do you see it in this story, but do you see it in your own life? Do you feel it? Do you hear it? I mean, we're outside. It's beautiful. You're in a camp chair. <laughs> and there's like a, a crow harassing us, right? <laughs> the scenery is breathtaking, and yet here we sit. The Holy Spirit can convict us of our sin, can convince us of our righteousness, no matter where you are. And maybe this morning, you're like, I thought this was an outdoor concert, and, it, and we, we worship God through music, and you're hearing a speaker, but I can't pass over, I can't gloss over the depth, the brutality, the gravity of this story in which we just read. We're going verse by verse with the story of Joseph, and here we are. For this family, I don't know, I don't know what it is for you if there's something you're like, man, I gotta, I gotta get right with God on that. I need to ask for forgiveness on that. I need to cut that out. I, that needs to not be a part of who I am. We all have something, and I don't know what it is for you, but for this family, it was playing favorites, it was jealousy, it was hatred, and eventually it was human trafficking. I've, uh, I've gone to uh, quite a few, um, I'm gonna invite the band up actually here at the end, one last story. I've gone to quite a few prisons and jails uh, talking to inmates. And I've sat there um, looking through the glass talking on the phone, talking to people as a chaplain, and they all have a similar story. They're like, I, I don't belong here. I can't believe I'm wearing this jumpsuit. I can't believe I'm on the side of the glass. Like, I don't even know how it all spiraled. I don't know how, it, how, how I ended here. This isn't, this isn't how it was supposed to go. The truth is, Satan is deceptive and he's real. Sin is dangerous and it's a powder keg. And there are things that can sink their claws into our souls and our hearts, our minds and our lives that shouldn't be there. And they keep you from who you should be. So this morning, the band is gonna sing one more song. I think it's uh, Who You Say I Am is one of the lyrics. And as they do that, um, I want you to think about where you are with God and if there's something in your life that you say, wow, I just saw that spiral out of control for those brothers from a twinge of emotion and jealousy down to human trafficking. So is there something in you that you're like, this is a little slippery, like this is a little dangerous game that I'm playing. I need to really cut that out before it becomes something catastrophic. I want you to be who God has intended you to be, and it's not an addict, and it's not a liar. You're not a cheater. You're not a hater. You're not a gossip. You're not a failure. You can be free. Freedom is always an option, always. Freedom from addiction, freedom from jealousy, freedom from hatred, freedom from bitterness, freedom from any of those things, from greed. There's always freedom in God. 